joining us. This is Paul Wilson. And Chris Hemke. And you're listening to Diesel Performance Podcast. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chris, we got a great show today. We're going to have on an awesome guest. we got Manfred uh, from Longhorn Fab Shop. He's been on the podcast a couple times before. He has, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Returning. We we love having Manfred on. Uh, I've uh, had a chance to talk with him several times in the past, get to meet him. Got to check out some of his products. Uh, we used his traction bars back on uh, some of our emissions equipped sled pulling I've trucks. I've been using his traction bars on a lot of uh, different customer builds. Yeah. Um, I like giving customers options. Sure. Um, one of the cool things with Longhorn is usually they're like a couple days and you have them yeah. <laughs> in hand. So that's cool. You don't get a ton of crazy colors and whatnot, but uh, really good craftsmanship, really good fitment, um, really cool looking bars. So Absolutely. Uh, but... Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about some of the other really cool <laughs> products <laughs> and, and projects that he's involved with. Uh, so, yeah, so we're really excited for that. Of course, we're going to hear from our super tech, Jeremy Garnett, uh, awesome. for our In the Shop segment. And then, Chris, what do we got from Calibrated Power from you today? Man, just an, another crazy week of build up and set up. We have several new turbos that we're going to be going live with over the next month or two. Yeah. Um, so you've been doing a great job in the media department trying to sneak out and leak out some info. <laughs> so I'm dealing with everyone asking questions about the turbo and not giving out too much info. Oh, that's good. We're talking about the 351 VE. Yep. We have a stealth turbo that's coming up. Um, Here's what here's what I can say, and here's what I'm sure you've been telling everybody. Yeah. We can tell you there is a turbo. Yeah. I, and we can tell you that it's going to be awesome, I can, and we can tell you that it's not ready right now. I can tell you that there are turbos <laughs> coming. Uh, I can tell you that I've personally been testing them for the last year. Yep. <laughs> um, we have a really good recipe. I, I'm really, really excited. Um, yeah, this is something you're – so we, we've talked so much on the show about twin kits, and we they ripped the twin kit off of your truck yep. to put on a single turbo. Um, just overall, now that, now that we're at a final production unit, uh, what do you think – how do you feel about that? How do you feel about going from twins to a single? So the the compounds were really, really good. You know, I'm not going to sit there and say anything negative in the drivability category, uh, category at all. They're phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but the serviceability was horrible. The right. fitment was super tight. Um, doing oil changes because of all the added piping, it was right in front of where your oil filter is. Sweet. So it was a total nightmare. <laughs> um and the, there were times where, depending on the temperature and depending on how I was driving the truck, you'd get the rattles on the frame with the with the downpipe and stuff, and there's just there's not a lot of room, right? Yeah. Um, what I can say about the single turbo was I was nervous at first. I know what some of the drop-in variable vane turbos on the market drive like currently, yeah. and that's what I wasn't looking forward to. Um but I can say we've had we had four different turbos on the truck uh, from last March until until about maybe three months ago. Um, every uh, rendition got a little better, um, <laughs> and we we have a lot of data. So I mean, we have a lot of data off of that truck. I I put over fifty thousand miles on the compounds, um, making big boost numbers, towing, daily driving, sled pull, drag race, you name it. The truck did it. Yeah. Now going into a single turbo. With the same platform, same fuel system, same trans, same everything, and being able to back up a similar number on less boost, okay, <laughs> less drive pressure, um, was was really humbling to see that, right? Because yeah. that, that makes sense that we are moving in the right direction. Um, but the drivability, man, I, honestly, I can't say that much was lost there either. So you still get very good response down low. You get a real broad mid-range. Um, and I've limited my truck's power output by the fueling, right? So I, I have more air on top. So um, waiting another month for the weather to break and go grab the boat out of storage and hook it up and start playing around with some towing. Yeah, see but, what this uh, thing. Yeah, but see what it does in the real world. Overall, I love it. overall, man, it, it drives it drives really really well. So I think. Uh, on behalf of everyone here and my my existing customers and current customers, I think everyone's going to be really happy. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you there. This is one I know we're really excited for. We're getting ready to shoot some product video on it here yep. in the in the next few weeks. Um, guys, do want to give you a reminder? We did release early information. Uh, this is the first place we have released it, um, except maybe a notice to our dealers. Uh, we are doing a March tuning madness sale. Yeah, super excited about that the too. Entire month of yep. March. Uh, we're going to knock 15% off on your L5P tuning calibrations, your EasyLink, and your uh, EFI Live. 
all those, you're going to see a 15% off break. Uh, so really, really excited for that. That's coming up real quick for you. Yep. Going to run March 1st to March 31st, of course. So we'll do it for the whole month. Increase the durability, line pressure, and performance of the Allison transmission in your GM 6.6 .6 liter Duramax LML and L5P with the XDP EPC solenoid fuller plug. From the factory, the EPC solenoid increases line pressure up to 230 PSI during shifting. Once the shift is complete, the pressure drops back down to 80 PSI. At 80 PSI of line pressure, your Allison cannot hold the added stress from aftermarket upgrades or heavy towing. The XDP EPC solenoid fooler fixes this issue by installing onto the solenoid and back into the valve body. This lets your transmission effectively operate at 230 PSI all the time. This eliminates clutch slipping, poor shifting, and extends transmission life. To find out more about the XDP EPC solenoid fooler plug, check out xdp.com or find a local dealer near you. You guys know today's other sponsor is Exergy Performance, and today we're talking about their Winter Blend Fuel Additive. Now this is SKU numbers E09, 00014, and also 00016. Uh, it depends on what size bottle you want. This supports all diesel vehicles, so if you're listening to the show, you presumably will want to perk up here and go grab yourself some of this stuff. Chris and I are right now under the way on doing some testing with it ourselves. Exergy Performance Diesel Additive Winter Blend provides the ultimate in protection and longevity for the diesel injectors and fuel pumps by increasing the fuel's lubricity to exceed the recommendations of the Engines Manufacturers Association and provides exceptional protection against corrosion. The Winter Blend chemically alters diesel fuel to ensure engines remain operable in freezing climates by reducing paraffin wax per precipitation. Cold starts, fuel economy, and power are also improved by increasing the diesel fuel's cetane by up to five points and cleaning internal components. Also, uh, we always want to give our shout out to uh, another one of our sponsors is WC Fab, that's Worley Custom Fabrication. Today we're talking about their 2017 to 2019 L5P Duramax 4-inch intake kit with airbox. Uh, this is WCF. 100344. The WC Fab 2017 to 2019 GM L5P 6.6 .6 liter Duramax 4 inch intake kit and airbox is the high flow fabricated aluminum intake pipe and airbox enclosure with dry filter assembly that replaces the restrictive plastic factory parts on your diesel. This will improve your overall engine performance. This all new design significantly increases airflow to your turbo, producing improved horsepower and torque, quicker throttle response, and cooler intake temperatures by drawing cold air through the ram air duct and inner fender. There, all aluminum construction features a large diameter four inch piping with smooth aerodynamic bends to improve intake air velocity, volume, and provide more aggressive engine and turbo sound during acceleration. High quality hardware, silicone boot, seals, and stainless steel T-bolt clamps enclosures are optimum for durability with ease of installation. The removable airbox lid allows for easy visual inspection and maintenance of your WC Fab filter with included hydrophobic pre-filter cover. This will help keep your MAF sensor, turbo, and engine airways contaminant free. The critical ram air duct seal has been moved to the bottom of the hood for a clean engine compartment appearance. Full assembly finished in your choice of WC Fab signature custom powder coat colors for a look that's unique to your truck. This installs easily with basic hand tools, does not require any additional tuning and is completely bolt on and it'll fit with no other required modifications. It is not compatible with the WC Fab intake resonator pipe. Um, Chris. One of the other things I think that is really, really fun that we do on the show is taking a look at our knowledge base over at Duramax Tuner. Yeah. Guys, it, it's it's basically a great place for instructions, quick answers to questions, um, detailed how-tos, and and step-by-step -step guides and tutorials. If you haven't checked it out, you can, of course, check out DuramaxTuner.com. 
go to the top, you'll see the learn more and just click on the knowledge base. One, one of the things, Paul, I want to touch on is it's it's general knowledge on the tuning hardware that we work with. Yeah. So I've had guys that have had like PPEI tuning or other various competitors that we work with in the EFI or the EC Link space. Um, and that's still an outlet for those customers or those guys to Absolutely. be able to look at. So we do it as a general knowledge base, like we say, because it's general knowledge on the product, right? There's nothing specific to EFI Live as a hardware and EasyLink as a hardware. It's the tuning itself that the tuning company provides. Yeah. So it's it's a huge outlet, I think, for guys that you know, the first time doing it, it's confusing, you know, and sometimes <laughs> written instructions, you know, it gets a little tough. You need to read it in a, in a different way sure, um, or have somewhat of a visual, you know, at the same time. So, you know, all the guys, they did a great job with that stuff over the last couple of years. Absolutely. We are evolving that segment. We have been having on Sean Lynn to yeah. read a knowledge base article. Uh, we're going to change that up, make that a little bit more fresh, a little bit more exciting of a segment. It's still going to come at the very end of the show, uh, but stay tuned because next up is an awesome conversation that we're we're going to have with Manfred from Longhorn Fab Shop. Manfred, how the hell are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for asking. So today, uh, Manfred, we got you on the show so we could talk a little bit about Longhorn Fab Shop, some of the products you guys got going on, some of the projects you've been involved with. Uh, I know you've been on the show to tell us about how you got started in diesel performance. Tell us a little bit more about uh, how your how Longhorn Fab Shop has changed over the last kind of three to five years here. Yeah, so we've been hot and heavy on traction bars and truck parts, razor parts, and things like that. Uh, we have a small truck service shop down here as well in one of the buildings. And uh, a few years ago, they were needing an engine stand because they were tired of the Harbor Freight engine stands, and then they would buy in a more expensive Harbor Freight engine stand from a catalog that wasn't labeled Harbor Freight, <laughs> and they got tired of every time. I mean, have you ever hung a 7.3 off an engine stand, and it says it's rated for, like, 2,000 pounds, and the well, back of the 7.3 is mounted to the engine stand, and the front bell housing is, or the front harmonic balancer is, like, touching the ground? I mean, I you know, not, you on, got a, like a not on a 7.3. Under it. Like, how many shops? Dude, how many shops have a tire underneath a freaking engine in the front to keep it from flipping over? As you're saying this, I keep thinking about all the inline motors I've done and how there's not a good engine stand for that stuff and how literally everything sits in a tire. So, yes, 100%. Yep. Oh, yeah. So they wanted to – they're like, we should buy an engine stand, a good one. So we're looking around, and there's a huge price gap between, like, if you spend 200 to, like, 800 you're getting the same Harbor Freight engine stand. It's just packaged differently. And then once you get over, like, 1000 bucks, you get something, like, decent. And then um, after that, the price jump is huge. It's, like, six $7,000. For an engine and stand? And so for an engine stand, wow. yeah. I didn't know they got that. So if you get into bit. some – some commercial some commercial style ones industrial style engine stands okay so the plan was well we're a fab shop we'll just build one in-house we have uh, i'm an engineer and we got the fabrication equipment all the software so we'll just build one and it turned into quite the adventure um of something we thought would take maybe a couple months ended up taking a year to figure out the right combination because it turns out Rotating things that have a huge um, variance in center of gravity turns out to be quite problematic when you try to rotate it or stop it um, or what happens if the power goes out and how do you keep that engine from spinning around if someone kicks the cord out from it. And we looked at some other ones, and when we talked to customers that even were spending the seven or $8,000, they were still disappointed in what they got. It still wasn't able to rotate an engine. The locking mechanism just wasn't that great um, to keep the engine from rotating around because the center of gravity on these engines changes drastically as you take parts off of it. So you'd think if I can spin a fully dressed engine, then surely I can spin an engine that has, you know, all the accessories and everything taken off the front of it. And as you tear the motor down, it actually gets harder to spin because the center of gravity moves one direction to the other and uh, it makes it a lot more difficult. Well, Clearly so we started building and testing and different shafts, different gearbox motors, different controls, and had a pile of 
motors and controls and gearboxes. I would have been better off just buying a stinking engine stand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, clearly, all the R&D ended up working out because 2019, Paul and I are at UCC. We go into your beautiful booth, and we see Duramax motors rotating like a rotisserie chicken. So, <laughs> I mean, clearly, it ended up working. <laughs> We finally came. We finally got the right combination, um, and uh, so we have them now. They're built specifically for us with our specifications. Um, we're considered an OEM for that gearbox motor combination. Um, so yeah, so we started selling them um, at, to a bunch of different shops. Actually, um, Pure Addiction was the, one of the first shops to purchase one. They purchased one off of a picture from a text. <laughs> and uh, he was like, shoot me a price. I will take it. Let me know when it's done. And wow. so we got him an awesome price in exchange for he would test it for us uh, since they do a bunch of engines out there. And so, yeah, Travis Turner bought that first one prepaid a year early on that thing, <laughs> knowing that that's some confidence right there that we were going to that we were going to come through for him. That's some trust. And, yeah. You know, uh, oh, yeah. And so, um, yeah, so we started building them for different shops. Um, and we had, I think, I think we had seven at PRI last year. Wow. Um, and different booths. So different engine shops. We had one at Suncoast booth. Um, one was spinning that billet motor from Fleece. Uh, we had one in Rottler's booth. Um, one up in Myers or two up in Meyer, I think. One in Premier. So we had them all over the place. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that that shows that there is quite a bit of demand there. Um, tell us a little bit more. So, so it, it, it rotates everything. You you have a unique gearbox, a unique kind of motor and gearbox setup to it. Um, I mean, these things are huge, though, aren't they? I mean, I mean, isn't it? It would it only be like a really high end builder who's doing a lot of engines be somebody who like would actually be interested in this fancy of an engine stand? Yeah, so that was originally what we thought. We didn't really think about, you know, cross-selling it or marketing it in other industries. Um, but what we found out is we're kind of open source on the front plate of it. So um, we let people design their own adapters. We'll build custom adapters for it. Um, we keep them in stock, which is a huge thing. And then um, we sell – it's priced based off the diesel industry. So we could probably charge two or three times this, what we sell it for in other industries. But we kind of use the diesel industry as a baseline of what we feel is a comfortable and fair amount to make on them and a fair price. And that's attracted a lot of industrial um, manufacturing facilities as well. Uh, companies like SpaceX are using them to build the starships um, that are planned for manned flight to Mars and things like that. So it's been crazy to see um, all the pictures of, you know, what people are doing with them and the adapters they're building. And then we're building some adapters for SpaceX. We just ship them the engine stands or they call them and we call them industrial rotators. When they go to um, like industrial facilities, we set the, the controls up a little bit different when they go to an industrial facility. So it's cool to be able to build the different components and the adapters and the, and the rotators. And then we send them out there and then you get to watch the launches and then we get all the privy information of what they're actually building on them. So when you watch the launch, like, you know, you have a part in like that specific part, your machines are being used to assemble it. So it's really cool. That's so, so crazy. That was a really subtle way to, you know, lead into SpaceX. How did, how did that whole thing come about? Like, can you give us a little background? Like how does someone in the diesel industry tunes diesels with EFI live at one point is really heavy in traction bars, you know, long, longhorn fab end up having an opportunity to work with SpaceX. Did you tweet Elon? Yeah. I thought about it. I've been hashtagging him like crazy, but it's nothing, nothing so far. And I don't know how their books go, but I could really like at this point, I'm, I'm really starting to feel like maybe we could just like do like Tesla credits or like Bitcoin now that he owns a bunch of Bitcoin, you know, and then I can just trade that in for a Tesla. So I, I'm not really sure how that works. You know, maybe we could do our own crypto in like engine stands, like eight engine stands is a Tesla. Like four more engine stands is ludicrous mode gets unlocked. Like <laughs> I'm not where I'm not sure where it's going, but I think it's got definite potential. Right, right. That seems like the logical path based on the fact that you started off making traction bars and had really fancy packaging for them. So, yeah. so this all, <laughs> this I totally would have guessed this a few years back. No, but, yeah, but yeah, Chris makes a good exactly. point. How, how the hell do they find you? I, I mean, industrial rotators. Does that mean like your engine stands or, or your industrial rotators are 
are being used on the assembly line? Yeah, so when they build um, components for the Starship, um, which are the big silo, silver silo-looking rockets that they're testing right now, Yeah. Um, there are components inside that that have to be rotated in order to assemble them. And so they make um, adapters for the rotators. We make adapters for them and send them with the rotators, and then they bolt it on there. And since it's adjustable speed, reversible, foot pedal controlled, they can roll it around. Um, they can um, they can actually you know use it to assemble equipment and and parts that are getting bolted onto the starship for them. Wow, that is insane. It it is, is really crazy. really wild to think of too. It is we've been building rockets as a society for a little while. Yeah, yeah. the fact that they they still oh, yeah. had a need for a new industrial <laughs> rotator right. and like even Tesla was like this seems like a really stupid project. Has anybody else spent a lot of time doing it? And then they found man. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> he used to do low tunes. <laughs> it was crazy because I'm, I'm driving in the car. Like I was in the, um, I was in the car headed to Michigan with my family. And it was like the first vacation I'd taken like five years. And so we're like, you know what? We're going to Michigan. We're going to go snowmobiling, hang out with some college friends and their family and just have like this nice relaxing, um, this nice relaxing weekend. It was like right on my birthday. And so I was driving up to Michigan. It's like eight o'clock at night and like everyone's starting to drift off, go to sleep or doze off, paying, not paying attention. And I'm like, I'm getting tired too and bored of driving. And I get an email on my phone and it says, uh, it was, it was like, uh, quote for 201052 dash C, which is our product lo- code for the engine stand. And then it was like, Estimated uh, lead time, expedited shipping, uh, please provide quote ASAP. And you know when you get these emails, you're like, oh, my gosh. Like, it's another freaking uh, wanting me to ship it some overseas country. They want me to to accelerate the shipping. They don't want to pay any type of, like, verified currency or invoice, you know. (laughs) And it's it's – you get them all the time. And when it's real specific, like, they want – I want this, and I want it shipped this way, and I want you to pay for shipping – and it has to it has to ship Monday, and I was like, whatever. And I like browsed through it, and I was just kind of like just grunted a little about it. I was like, oh my gosh, here we go again. And so I like saw it come up on my screen, and I swiped down. And as soon as I swiped down, it said like the person's name, and then underneath it, SpaceX. And I was like, pull over. <laughs> <laughs> Wake so up, family! There, SpaceX. We know, made it. <laughs> What's going on? I was like, I got to answer this email. And so <laughs> I sent him back an email. And it was, it was crazy because I had just finished uh, listening to the audiobook of the biography on Musk and uh, about, like, SpaceX and all that stuff and how, uh, how under the gun those guys are as far as project timelines. And there's no excuse for a late project and things like that. Yeah. And so I sent back and I was like, Hey, here's a deal. Like it's a six week lead time on these, um, right now. Like I was back before we were stocking them or anything. And I was like, but I was like, I have this blue one that went to, uh, uh, diesel, the diesel show, which was UCC. And, uh, I was like, it's never been used in industry, but it's rotated for a couple weekends and um you know i'll give you a discount on it but i can ship that one on monday and uh i got an email back and it was like perfect here's our credit card charge it and and expedite it to us Jesus. and so i know it was crazy and so i ship it out there and they were excited about it but there's always like there's always this huge um like not necessarily nervousness but you're always there's always anxiety when you're shipping into a new customer especially items like this because your expectations for yourself are really high. Um, you know, you obviously know their expectations are super high. Um, and anytime you're sitting into a new industry, you don't under, you don't always understand exactly, you know, what their expectations are and things like that. So we've always tried to build them. You know, this is the one, one of the products where we really got to go above and beyond and, and not be apologetic for the price and say, this is the best unit that we can build. Um, and we put our heart and soul into designing it and testing it and selling it and making it. And, and it was cool that when they got it, like it goes through, um, they have like a separate process. It goes into like a receiving and then it gets distributed out 
um, to the different areas out there. And so when they finally got it, like they sent an email back and they're like, wow, this is a really well built uh, machine. Like we're so excited to be able to use this. This is exceeds our expectations of other products we bought in the past and stuff like that. So that was really like validating for us as a company to send something out there. Um, when you know that their standards are like sending humans into space, like the standards are pretty freaking high. <laughs> well, not, not high enough to not buy used shit. What's it's right. like they went on to Facebook Marketplace and found this right. crap. What the hell? <laughs> no, of course. That's oh, amazing. Dude. So, yeah. So to come to find out after talking to them and stuff like that, um, they end up, it was, they end up finding it on Instagram, like just randomly someone was into razors or diesel trucks and, it had come up in conversation, and someone was like, "Oh, I know, I know a shop that was building these," and that was it. That's Dude. amazing. People buy from people, man. Yeah, I, I mean, that's just one yeah, of those true. realities, right? It's like, like you said, there was somebody who worked there who was like scrolling, scrolling what on Instagram or liked what on Instagram <laughs> to randomly yeah. come across and see. Because you guys have a cool social media feed, yeah. um, but it's mostly trucks. I, I mean, from what I've yeah. seen, yeah, right. So like scrolling past it and being like. Oh, I saw this engine stand that rotates. It's and so I pay, badass. I paid attention enough yeah. to that out of whatever my social media feed is. And it's going to turn our rockets. To be like, no, 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 <laughs> this is cool. We'll use this here. Like, hey, buddy. Yeah. Hey, to that guy, we love you. Um, exactly. That, that's so exactly. awesome. So so where, as you've, as you've been developing the engine stand, and I noticed kind of since the engine stand, we've seen more and more of – of a draw to you guys in the industrial applications. Um, are, are you, do you feel like the company's moving away from diesel performance or is it, is it just growing and other segments are, are growing more rapidly? Um, it's since we've had almost no presence in the industrial part, that part's been growing really rapidly. Um, but the cool part is, and um, like you'll see some other companies as well, it happens the same way is that the when you grow the industrial part of it, when you have these steady industrial um, products, um, it really gives you the buying power to make the diesel products come to market faster with higher quality. So okay. we just, we've got our um, professional grade rod ends and our professional grade traction bars, which are always the highest, um, like we always bought them, like the most expensive rod ends that were kind of available um, with that volume. Um, there's like one other rod end that is uh, a lot more expensive generally, um, and it is it's kind of the up and coming thing, and we've never had the buying power to be able to make a transition into that, and so then as our other side of this business grows, it gives us a lot of capital. So now um, we just got in a huge shipment of these rod ends that we and we were able to purchase them at a volume that it wasn't a cost increase to the customers. And then we were offering any customer that already had our pro grades and wanted to upgrade to this new style pro grade, they could get them at 50% off. Oh my. Wow. That's awesome. And so, and so it's, it's cool because it really helps both industries. The diesel parts um, give us the like retail side of it where you get, when you sell something to an industrial customer, if they never find a flaw, you never know there's an issue because you're only sending them one to 10 a year, maybe 20 of something a year. Um, and you don't really, you don't really find those like high volume issues that you find when you sell a retail or a consumer grade product. And so with diesel parts, like you're sending out thousands of traction bars out there, <laughs> and people will nitpick and oh, they'll yeah. find faults and they'll they'll you'll have damaged shipments and you'll send freight that gets damaged and you'll send. I mean, you you just run into all these issues. Boxing. How do you palletize? Um, and the, just the sheer volume of it, just by sheer terrible luck sometimes, you're going to get <laughs> stuff destroyed or people are going to find a fault or there's going to be something in the manufacturing process um, that, you know, you don't catch till it gets to a customer. And so that part of it really helps the industrial side because then we build everything on the industrial side as if it was going, you know, as if we're making thousands of these and it's going to consumers and they're going to nitpick it apart and, you know, the paint. That's one thing like, He's out there like, wow, they're painted so well. I'm like, well, we got to deal with people on a daily basis that complain about <laughs> if the paint's not perfect. On a traction you know? bar like, oh, that's going to have a rock chip. On all this. <laughs> yeah, they're like, we're going to step on all this anyway. Like, I don't know why you put such a nice paint job on these. And, like, we rivet stainless logos onto the rotators. 
and all that stuff. And they're like, oh, man, this is like so above and beyond. And for us, like being in this, doing this for like 10 years now in the diesel industry, like it's pretty standard, like riveted on logos, stainless logos, you know, pretty powder coating, um, dealing with UPS, FedEx, you know, yeah. LTL freight, getting destroyed. Like that's just a normal thing, you know, so <laughs> – it really, it really helps both ways. And then the industrial guys, I mean, they, they put the vault, they put the, um, they put the hours on them. You know, even if you, a guy's building one or two engines a, a week, even, um, isn't really that many rotations. Uh, like when we spin an engine at UCC, it's about a weekend of rotations at UCC is about 15 years of engine building. Oh, when it comes wow. to the number of rotations it sees, yeah. <laughs> so they don't really, but then. On the, on the converse side, like SpaceX, it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Oh, my Jesus God. Christ. Yeah. Now, is there like so an, it's just, is there an overhaul for these? Like, you know, have you had to, like, take them in and do, like, an overhaul on, on the pump or on the motor or whatever it is? Or, like, you've been good so far? Yeah, so far we've been good. What they – we underrate what that motor is actually capable of. Okay. And we can – we can control that in the actual drive unit. Oh wow! Um, that the actual electronics that drive that gearbox. Um, and so for the industrial applications, there's they get opened up a little bit more because they it, they're buying it for a very specific rating. And that once they get it, it's up to them to decide how they use it, the speeds they use, um, stuff like that. But our that assembly comes with um, it's a lifetime warranty on the structure. And it's five years uh, on the gearbox, motor, and drive. Wow. Unconditional. That's crazy. That's... Especially for running, because like you said, you start to think about it, and you're like, well, do rotations equal wear? And you're like, well, on, on the, probably the most critical components, yes. Um, but I, I do have some questions as I start to think about some of the problems you mentioned earlier in the show was like, how do you get it to not just free spin if it's unplugged um can you talk a little bit about like what makes the engine stand unique like how you were able to solve some of those problems with this yeah so a big thing um, a lot of people use worm gear drives on them and the worm gear drive depends on a pretty much a brass worm inside holding up they're almost all brass and if they get into any sort of bind it gets really hard to rotate them um and so we went to a completely separate drive system that doesn't have that inherent brake that a worm gear has, but it gets rid of all the issues that you have with worm gear drives as far as wear, as far as the, um, the binding that happens with that worm because it's spread between two bearings and it can flex and bend and then it has issues there. So we went to a completely separate system, but doesn't then have that inherent um, uh, braking system that a worm gear has because of the way it's designed so ours actually has a, an electromagnetic brake that defaults to the brake position so it actually takes electricity to disengage the magnetic brake on it so if you're rotating this around and you let off the foot pedal um, the foot pedal is also what we would consider a dead man switch so if you get hung up in this engine where it picks you up off the ground or snags your pant pocket and and lifts you up off the ground, it's going to pull your foot off this pedal, and that automatically engages the electromagnetic brake, and it releases it, um, and there's friction clutches in there, uh, almost kind of like a lawnmower, but in reverse. Sure. Um, and so when the elect same thing happens when the electric goes out. If you're working on this thing or you're underneath it, which you're not supposed to be, but we know that people look underneath with a flashlight trying to look up in the engine underneath it, um, and the power goes out, you don't want that thing spinning around and smacking you in the face. Um, and so the, the, so we have this braking system in there as a fail-safe. That's so cool. That's, that's wild. Isn't, isn't that, Chris, that's one of those problems where, where, like you mentioned, when you're developing a product, you start off with this really simple idea of i'm going to solve this problem right like i need an engine stand that's oh, yeah. better than harbor freight but doesn't cost me eight thousand well, dollars like like what was right. mentioned in the yeah. beginning of this interview most diesel shops like smaller diesel shops that i i deal with and i i know like i said do motor builds it is a harbor freight engine stand and a fucking tire underneath it like that 100%. is the norm right 100 percent. and then here comes oh, yeah. manfred yep. like oh i'm gonna build something fucking badass but i'm gonna make it <laughs> super safe <laughs> and now like he's telling us some things and like what you just asked him about like the fail safe you know with, with how everything moves like i wouldn't have even thought of that 
But yeah. I would have been the asshole with my head underneath it looking <laughs> up, getting fucking smacked in the head, right? So it's just, it is mind-blowing to me the amount of technology that has gone into something that the, you, you pretty much created, like you, you created a, a specific channel to the market. And there was a necessity, and to a point where, for myself, I didn't even think there was such a necessity. But now as we talk about it, it's a big fucking deal. Like, how did it take this long to get this? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, no, I'm wild. with you. And we're, I mean, we caught the same slack. You know, we talked to, we try to, you know, put together some sort of panel or talk to people or just bring it up in casual conversation. And there were, there were a lot of people that were like, no one's ever going to buy that. <laughs> like we have, like we're just fine with putting it on a tire, and I and, and I, it used to really get to me where I was like, what? you know, like I was gonna try to convince them, like you know what, your tire sucks, you know, <laughs> but fuck your person, tire. <laughs> but if a person, if a person sees this, and they're using a Harbor Freight tire and a or a Harbor Freight stand and a tire, and they see this and say that's shit. There's nothing I can say. Like, if you can't see that your Harbor Freight engine stand and your tire setup is insufficient, dangerous, and um, is an opening for poor quality, there's nothing I can say to you that's going to change your mind. Well, that goes, I that's mean, the truth. as I'm getting older and I experience things, like, you, you, you're you going to be able to relate to this, Manfred, like, when you used to tune trucks— Oh, well, I could buy an edge tuner for a third of the price. Okay, well, don't go do that. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, my bad. But once you drive a truck with a custom tune, right, that's more expensive and you experience that, now that's the new norm. That's what you have to have. I'm not going to hook up, you know, 10,000 pounds behind an old, you know, early 90s or late 80s pickup truck in tow. I'm going to hook up to a newer truck that has a, a more dense frame, better braking. I want those attributes of what I'm more familiar with or what I'm comfortable with. And that's kind of the same right. thing with the engine stand. You can use a tire in the Harbor Freight stand, but once you see and actually experience a, a better option or something that's going to cater to you uh, to do your job better, it just makes right. everything that much more of a necessity, is, in, in my opinion. All right? I mean, that, that, that's yeah. what this is. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think it, 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 it reminds me of one of those, like, when we look back at how we used to do things, Chris. Like, I, I think I remember yeah, a story from you of, like, like, all of like all, it's oh, I used, to tear, I used to tear a 12-valve apart with, you know, a, a five-gallon bucket full of six tools, right? Yeah, like, yeah. like, yeah, okay, we did do that. I did do that, yeah. But, but we don't do that anymore. I don't anymore. do that no more. And, and I, I wonder right. about, like, engine stands. And even, like, when we start to think about, like, putting traction bars on our truck yeah. and, and doing other basic necessities with our trucks. Um, they just become second nature after a while where yeah. we're just like, this is now the minimum acceptable standard. Yeah. So that that's really what, what I right. want to ask my last question to you, Manfred, is what's next? I'm already over this. Damn. <laughs> Manfred, um, just tell Paul that you're over him, okay? <laughs> it's already old news. It's already old news. <laughs> Well, we're looking at we're looking at a larger engine stand, believe it or not, um, which is largely driven by the heavy duty guys, um, the C13 style engines that size, um, the ones that are coming out of a lot of like we looked at it and and with the semis and stuff like that, those got a lot of those guys in frame them, so we weren't right. really sure if there was a market for it, um, but. The more we got talking with construction, uh, they're not in framing excavators. They're oh, no all shit. come out. Wow. So there's no room to work. And so they're pulling those motors out and doing them. Um, so we have a we have a larger one designed. We just need a customer that wants like ten of them to justify making it. <laughs> <laughs> for all you listeners yeah. out there. <laughs> for all of you listeners yeah, who have the buying be, power. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's heavy. It's heavy duty enough. Like it comes with crane hooks. So wow, that's that's a that's going to be a huge thing for us. Um, we just got ISO nine thousand one certified, which is a big deal for us. That opens up a lot of opportunities and projects that we weren't eligible to bid on before, especially when you're doing um, defense work and things like that. And then there's a tiering system um, that we found out that once you're selling like into the aerospace industry. Um, you're only allowed to bid on certain tiered projects according to what your certifications are. And so that helps us, positions us to be, um, we can sell, we can make aerospace quality parts and sell them at like a diesel market price, <laughs> which they've been, which they've found is very intriguing. So 
um, that's huge. And anything we can do to expand the business is going to help the, the diesel side, like we talked about before, um, just having the sheer buying power, um, the machines, equipment, um, when you can have machines being paid for by one industry and they can also knock off some, some parts into another industry, it really lets you expand quicker, um, and more efficiently. And, and in the end, the consumer benefits on both sides. That's so cool. That's super cool. I'm so excited. Uh, Manfred, anybody you want to give a shout out to today? Yeah, definitely. So uh, my wife and I own Longhorn, but she's the one that keeps us in business for sure. Um, she keeps track of all the money around this place and, and all our production scheduling and purchasing and stuff like that. So all these projects, anyone that enjoys the engine stands or other products can thank her. She makes all this stuff uh, possible here. And then we have uh, Colton that does a lot of the welding and Cody does a lot of welding and machining here. Um, and they've both been an integral part and uh, always willing to, to step it up. So I appreciate their help um, as well. So. Well, that's awesome, man. Well, Manfred, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing our time with us. Uh, and I know our listeners are going to love this episode. Yeah. Guys, uh, make sure you give Manfred some good feedback either over on the Longhorn Fab Shop Facebook page, Instagram page, or, of course, tag him in any of our posts over there on the Fans of Diesel Performance Facebook group. Uh, guys, make sure you also stick around. Chris, don't forget, we got another segment coming up from Jeremy Garnett in the shop. Jeremy Garnett, how the hell are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Uh, Jeremy, of course, is our super tech here for our, our in the shop segment. Jeremy, I know you got a great truck for us today. What are we talking about? Oh, we got an 06 Cummins. Oh, MK's favorite. Yeah. All right. All right. What happened to the cum dog? Uh, truck was potentially on its way here for some noise uh, coming from the CP3 area. And on his way here, he believes he blew a head gasket. No. What made him think he blew a head gasket? I uh, started seeing uh, coolant temps rise, uh, coolant dripping on the ground, oh. and overheating. And, yeah. Oh, that's brutal. Brutal. You're on your way to the shop yeah. for one thing, which you already think is probably not going to go great. Right. <laughs> Noise from your CP3 area is not a good thing. Uh, and then on the way, you're like, oh, great, the sweet smell of coolant and no heat in my truck. <laughs> right. Wonderful. I wonder what this could be. And it's a coming, so you're like, I wonder what this could be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. All right. Truck shows up. Where are we at today with it? Well, at this point, we needed to uh, just to figure out what was going on with this overheating problem. You right. Know, let's... So what we did is we go, uh, got the approval. We went ahead and pulled the head and just inspected it. Um, he didn't drive on it very long, so it wasn't like he was driving on it for a month and then was like, yeah, I need to get this fixed. So we wanted to see what was gone, if it was just a bad head gasket or something internal. Yeah. So we went ahead and we pulled the head, and on number six cylinder, we now we see scoring on the cylinder wall and then a lot of soot inside that cylinder. Uh, now, that that's a, a, a pretty well-known indicator of some massive problems. Why don't you fill in our listeners on what we're looking at when we see that? Well, I mean, there's, it could be bad injectors. It could be bad fuel. It could just be uh, overboost. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, so at this point, we just uh, need to get a hold of the customer and see where he wants to go and what he wanted to do. Yeah, because that, that's a tough situation because now that we're that far into it, it – there's only so many options for repair, right. which you're looking at at what honing, and and then you're you're not going to put back stock heads, so no. you're at the very least can do some basic honing there, um, or I'm sorry, some basic head work there, right. uh, and then and then of course you're going to want to stud it, if not fire ring it, like exactly, like yeah. like a lot of our Cummins guys are known to do, um, and then we're still. That's just the coolant issue. <laughs> right. We still have to figure out what that, that noise, quote unquote, I'm doing air quotes like right. people can see me on a podcast, <laughs> air quote noise from the CP3 area was that could be anything from small to large as well. Exactly. Man, that's a tough situation. Uh, at this point, we're just going to go ahead and we're going to recommend a motor. Yeah. Um, just, he'll almost kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. And yeah. it's it's not worth going any further. Right. So, I mean, we can go any further and then just spend more money, more time. And then come back to the same conclusion and be like, okay, you need a motor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that is. That, that's a tough spot when you're in the shop, and, it, and it's not great news. It's not, oh, I found something stupid. Right. It's, 
oh, I found something stupid. <laughs> like, like this, <laughs> this, this, this one's going to be rough. All right, man. Well, hey, listen, we've all been there. We, you, you know, this is a part of the game. This is the the side that's maybe not as much fun, um, but but you know, it's 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 possible, right? It's right. out there. <laughs> uh, what's our pro tip of the week? Um, just be aware of the gauges, uh, temperature gauge. You know, you start seeing smoke or gauges go up. I mean, pull over, let the truck idle. You know, shut the truck down if you have to. I mean, yeah. just be cautious and be aware of gauges and what's going on. You know, that's such a good piece of advice. I, I laugh uh, way back when I first started here. Nick Pregnant uh, from Duramax Tuner had this LB7 that he just he was in love with. It was like he his first Duramax. It was it was his like special truck. They made like 1200 horsepower or something stupid. They were like with, like it was such a big deal to them. And he hadn't driven it in years when I started. It had been parked for like 2 or 3 years. And he and he, he they spent all this time, they got it ready, and we take it out to the track right when we very first started tuning LMLs. So like we were out testing our brand new version one of beta testing of LML tuning <laughs> and he brought the LB7 with and he raced the LB7 ran the best time it's ever run best it's ever run in its life he ran it down the track parked it and then he jumped in the LML he had his son with him they drove home so <laughs> me and two of the other guys who worked here at the time we drove the LB7 back and I I actually got to drive the truck I had driven it a few times it was no big deal it was a lot of fun great truck except we got about I don't know, three miles outside of the track. And as soon as it went from 35 to 55, I started rolling on the throttle real easy. Like, and next thing I know, I'm just watching the temp gauge, just climb, 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 <laughs> climb. And I'm going, when's it going to stop? When's it going to stop? When's it going to stop? And I start letting my foot out. And, and this is when I knew we were, we were just in your trouble, <laughs> just hosed is I let my foot out and I got all the way back down to 30 miles an hour and the gauge is still climbing. It wasn't climbing as fast, but it was still climbing. I was like, well, that's not going to stop. And, and sure as shit, it didn't. It was done. Uh, we, we had some massive issues. But uh, but yeah, man, no, that, that's a really good point. Take your time. Watch your gauges. And when you see something starting to happen, it's not to say that you're always going to be able to prevent it. It's not to say that like this guy is... Oh, right. if you would have watched your gauges, you could have backed out of it and prevented a head gasket. No, no. Pro <laughs> probably not from what it sounds like. Um, but for a lot of you guys out there, it could be the difference of doing a repair and doing a complete motor swap. Right. And I think that's the important part to keep in mind. Oh, this guy here. I mean, it's low truck, nice looking truck. Just you can tell it's been beat. Yeah. So. Yeah, man. Hard lives. hard lives. Hard lives pay hard bills. <laughs> yeah. That's truth. All right, guys. Hey, stick around to the show. We still got more coming at you. All right, guys, thanks for sticking around. Uh, we're working on on kind of molding this this knowledge base segment, so I, I appreciate you listening to the end of the episode and checking these out. We're trying to make them a little bit more exciting. Uh, today, I'm a little short-staffed. Uh, turns out the phones are crazy since we launched Switch on the Fly EFI Live Tuning for, or I'm sorry, Switch on the Fly Tuning for the L5P. Uh, it is done through HP Tuner, so... Uh, while the team is tied up with helping all of our customers, I'm going to jump in here and try to try to make this segment still work for our listeners. Uh, today, I pulled up our frequently asked questions. Uh, these are definitely some of the most popular questions that we've had throughout company history. Uh, questions like, "Will a Mac work on? Will a Mac computer work with EFI Live?" Uh, no, uh, there, there is a Windows emulator. Some guys have made it work with that. Uh, but in general, the answer is no. It's it's a huge pain in the ass if you're not like a total, if you don't totally understand what you're doing. Uh, can I use the Edge Insight CTS to switch tunes? Yeah, yeah. if you have an LB7 or LLY, does not work with any other trucks. Um, how do I know my CSP switch is working? On the back of the CSP switch, there's a little indicator light. Uh, it should flash to in the number of times to indicate the number of the tune you're in. So if it flashes four times, you're in tune number four. Um, does CPS uh, support DPF delete tunes? We don't. That's an easy one. No, 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 thank you. Uh, we haven't done that in a very, very long time, if ever. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it, it's just, we have so many opportunities to do emissions equipped performance. We don't need to take the risk of deleting DPFs. Uh, it's just unnecessary for us. It has been for a very, very long time. That was one of those obvious ones that uh, that was pretty clear in the industry 10 years ago. So uh, for today, I'm going to kick it back over to myself and Chris, and we'll close out this show. All right, guys, and that's our show today. Uh, thank you so much for listening. This has been Paul Wilson. And Chris Emke. Space.
SpaceX. We made it. 